Well, my first memory, I think I was probably two and a half or three. And I remember the house that I was living in. And I just remember it being stone and marble. And I remember there's an upstairs for sure. And I remember um, my grandfather would just give me a ride, on, you know, a piggyback ride. Um, or he'd put me on his shoulders and we would go to um, like the noodle house to have noodles almost every morning, you know, to have um, the Cambodian version of pho. Um, I assume it was every morning because I've been told it's every morning. So that's the earliest memory that I have. And there's a memory of we had a dog and kind of fluffy, small and white. And I remember just like liking to get messy with the dog. So um, when years later, when I asked my mom, like, do we ever have a dog? Oh, yeah, you you play with his poop. So we had to get rid of him because you couldn't stop. So that's the earliest memory I have. I was born in Bap Batambang, which was the second largest city in Cambodia before the communists took over the country. I was born in pretty much in, in, the, in the town center. I had a pretty good life before April 1975. That's when things started to change. And I was three and a half years old. And I don't remember a whole lot, but I do have bits and pieces. Um, I remember and been told that when the communists took over Batambang, when they chased the government soldiers out of the town, um, the first couple of days, they allowed to stay in the town. And then I think two days later, according to my dad, uh, they were told that you need to pack up, take what you can carry, and you have a few hours to take what you need because we're going to move you out of the town into little villages. You basically have to go back to your ancestral village. And my father came from a village called, I think it's called Don Thale. I'm not quite sure, but that was the um, ancestral village that his dad came from, my grandfather. So the family packed up and that's where they marched to. They walked to that village. And I don't have this memory, but I was told that my family knew what communism was about. They know what's going to happen, that they're going to target the middle class. And we were upper middle class. My grandfather was a successful businessman. So they destroy all documents they could find. They destroy all pictures, any evidence of our middle class life, and grab what they could. And before they left the house, my grandfather sat everybody down and said, when they question us, we have to tell them that we were farmers and we've always been in this village. We were farmers, we've always been in this village. You cannot talk about the past at all. And I was the only grandchild, I was the youngest. And they told me, my, my aunts told me that they were worried about me because when you're a little kid, you might slip. Because Cambodia is a very classist uh, society. You can tell someone's social class based on the words that they use. Like for example, the word mom, if you are from the farming class, the peasant class, you say book. If you are from the middle class, you say ma. So they were trying to train me to call, you know, my mom and my dad differently. Yeah, but I actually don't have that memory. So, but that's what I've been told. And then um, the earliest memory I have of being in the village for the first time is um, I was disgusted by the dirt because I was not used to that, to the mud, because Cambodia rains a lot and it gets very muddy. And I remember not wanting to walk because I didn't have shoes. You know, farming kids, poor people did not wear shoes. So we'd, I didn't have shoes and I didn't want to walk outside at all. I just, I just like, I'm not going outside. Yeah. yeah. But then my mom also said that within two to three days, I was out there playing in the mud like any kid. Um, I remember being bored because there was no school. Parents had to go to work. Anyone who was capable, whether you're 10, 11, or 12, had to go to work um, to cultivate rice or dig ditches. Um, my parents would say that most of the time they don't even know why they're doing something. They're just being told to do something. And I just remember just sitting around aimlessly. That's it. Yeah, and later on, of course, um, I think a year or a year and a half after we were in the village, things got really bad. Um, when the rice that people were 
cultivating were being shipped somewhere else, you know, to China, or just stored somewhere in a warehouse, and the people were not given the rice to eat. And, and that's when I started um, remembering being hungry, just like hungry all the time. There weren't any option. Either you work or you die. Either you work or they're gonna kill you, or they're gonna abuse you in some way. And my parents said that no one can trust anybody. You just can't trust anybody because you were so terrified of your neighbors snitching on you, telling on you. And people become very kind of selfish. If they have a little bit more than you, they won't share. Um, and my dad, because whenever I go to Cambodia, he's there and he's been telling me stories, family history. He, rem he said that um, people who were friends before the communists took over the countries were not friends anymore. And people he was, he was generous to was not generous back. If anything, he found out that his relatives who were poor, didn't have money, um, had the upper hand because they were valued by the communists because they were villagers. So cousins, aunts that were living in the village who were not in the city when he and his mom and dad and his sisters went back to the village, those relatives looked down upon him because now they have the upper hand because they were valued by the communist leaders because they were the, they're called the old people, the original people. And hit, um, they didn't really know how to farm because that's not their life, so, but those people knew so they were able to kind of grow their own um, fruits and vegetables, so they, they fed themselves better. But instead of giving a little bit, they would flaunt it. And it's kind of like my dad saw it as a way of them getting back at us because we used to have money. And then I asked him, like, well, did you flaunt your wealth? He said, no, if anything, we try to help them within reason. So it really turned um, families against each other. And midway through, I think my dad said 1976, they found out about our family. Um, about my grandfather um, being a successful businessman, and that's when they executed him. So, and then when they executed him, they said to my dad that you're next. But of course, they don't kill you right away because you have nowhere to go. You can't leave, so they kind of taunt you and, and, and scare you. So my dad knew that we have to leave this village because even then, there were talks about other villages being more, um, the leaders in certain villages were more friendly, you know, depending on who is running the village. And some villages have a, more to eat. So upon hearing about this, um, my mom learned from her relatives, because my mom came from a, a different village, that her village is more um, hospitable to life. So they, I'm, I was amazed that they did this. Um, my mom asked her sister um, from her village to see if they can get us to my mom's ancestral village where her parents are living. And I heard that my grandmother was well liked by the leader of the village. You know, she's well liked, well respected. So my grandmother, my mom's mom, asked the leader if my daughter and her son and me and my youngest brother who was born in 1975, um, right in the beginning of communism in the village, can come live. But of course, you can't just go. You need permission. Most likely, they will say no. So we snuck out in the middle of the night. And from what I've heard, was there's a man who, from my mom's village who was a fisherman. And it was all arranged that at night, they were going to sneak um, to the river bank, get on the little boat, and sail to my mom's village. And so that's how my dad and my mom and I and my brother managed to escape, because we were, he's certain that he, they would have executed him after my grandfather. My dad said there was more to eat. Um, he, was, uh, he was always afraid that they're, they're going to come after him. There's still that fear. Um, he said that was better, but not that much better. Because once again, people are hoarding. You know, when you don't have a lot, um, and when you do have just a little bit more, you want to save that for your own children. So he remembers seeing people having an extra piece of fruit, and he's hungry, and people just will not even give like a fourth. He remembers that. And my mom, of course, she felt safer being with her family, because her family, they, they were farmers. 
and they're still farmers. So she married a rich guy. So she knew, my mom knew how to farm. Um, I remember a story being told because my dad was kind of the spoiled little prince. Um, he, was, he was a son in a, in a Chinese household and never really had to do physical labor. And my mom was a farmer's daughter and she's, she's very strong, she's still strong. Um, they have to meet certain quotas in, in the rice field and my mom would always finish her work early and then help them. By then I was five or six in that village because when, when the communists was chased out of the, the city, I was seven and a half by then. Well, when the Vietnamese invaded the country and chased the communists, the Khmer Rouge, into the jungle, um, people, some, some people actually went into the town, into Battambang, to see what they can find. And we didn't do that because we were afraid. We weren't sure what was going on, so we stayed in the village. Um, and then by the time we were able to go into Battambang, we found out that people were just, they were, they were just going into any house, any, you know, any homes that they could find, any building, and just claim that's their own. And then when you don't have paperwork anymore, or paperwork doesn't mean anything, it's not yours anymore. So by the time we got back to our house in, in Battambang, it was settled by somebody else. So we had to go back to the village. And then there's just like, we, my dad said, we can start a life over. Um, my mom, she knew how to sew. So they were gonna set up a shop sewing clothes. Um, even then, there was no money. People were, were trading using rice. Basically, rice was a currency. You know, you, if you go buy um, ice, it will be a fourth, you know, one fourth can of rice. That's, that was the currency. <coughs> but they knew that we can't stay here. It's destroyed. There's nothing. And at the same time, they were not trusting of the Vietnamese, because the Vietnamese were communists, or com they're still communists. So like, we don't know. They've always been our, our um, historical enemies. What do they want? We just can't stay. We just have to go. So they knew that they have to escape to Thailand in some way. You know, not Vietnam, obviously, and not Laos, but Thailand is a country that is closest in terms of um, culturally with Cambodia. So, and my dad actually has an uncle who escaped to Thailand before the war. So the plan was to leave the country and go to Thailand. The justification is that the Khmer Rouge were causing trouble along the borders. They were causing a lot of trouble along the borders. Um, so the, the Vietnamese government need to put a stop. And also, uh, Hun Sun, who was a Khmer Rouge leader, um, was being targeted by other Khmer Rouge. So he went to Vietnam to persuade the Vietnamese government to help him, to help him um, basically, you know, rescue Cambodia, take over Cambodia. Oh, they were, they were, even though they were suspicious, my parents were grateful that the Vietnamese invaded and chase out the communists because the moment they got into the country, when my mom and dad and we were running, basically dodging bullets, um, the, the Vietnamese soldiers would actually give us their rations, their soldier rations, give us food, you know, and would warn us, like, do not eat too much because you have, you've been starving for so long to take it slowly. So they did see the soldiers as taking care of the people. And within a couple of months, they, in, they set up school again. Like, you can start going to school. So I do remember going to school, and that was my first schooling, is in um, a Cambodian school for a few months before we left for Thailand. So, and life was better. You had more to eat. So it was definitely improving. The first time was, um, I want to say within six months. You know, it was definitely before 1980. It was sometime in 1979. Um, probably around November or December, when we as a family, um, really just my grandmother, my, my dad's mom, all his sisters, and my mother, me, and my th two youngest brother, decided to leave. Um, and of course you can't leave, it's illegal, so you have to kind of leave at night uh, or walk and pretend that you're just going to visit somebody. So the first time we left, we actually got all the way to Thailand, and we encountered soldiers, not just our family, but other families too. 
and they put us on a bus. They said, oh, we're going to take you to the refugee camp, so get on the bus. And I actually have this memory where we're on the bus, but then the, the, the locals, the villagers, the Thai villagers, came by and looked at us on the bus, and they basically said, it's not good where you're going. You know, and they gave us food. They would hand food through the windows. And some of them were asking for um, Cambodian children, like, give us your kids, because they're not taking you to where they're, they're taking you. And sure enough, it was true. They basically took us back to Cambodia and pointed guns and said, go back home, go back home, go back home. And we had to walk down um, a mountain and walk back to my mom's village, her ancestral village. And if right now, if you go there by, by car on the highway, about 40 miles per hour, it take about two and a half hours to get to the mountain, to the border. But it took us a month to walk back because I asked my dad, how, I remember it just, it took us forever, dad, to walk. And I drove to the border. It was l less than two and a half hours. He said, a month. I'm like, a month? How is that possible? Well, he said, well, when there are landmines everywhere, you don't walk fast. You don't see a path. You don't walk. What do you do? He said, well, you wait for someone who is brave enough to go first, to walk first, because no one wanted to take that chance of stepping on a landmine. And my mom said that when they were walking, they would just see bodies everywhere being blown up by landmines. Yeah. And even still, bodies left over from the communists killing people. Yeah. My mom told me that as they were walking, my dad's mom, my grandmother said, oh, I am so hungry. It smells like dry fish. I am so hungry. And then my mom said, no, you need to look. You need to look around. It's actually burnt bodies. I remember camping, um, basically we carry you know, anything we could on our backs and just um, using tarp to camp and then it would rain. So, so after, that experience, after that experience, we're like, we're not doing this again. We're, we're not gonna try to escape. But within um, a few more months, my dad just like, we can't, there's nothing here. We'd rather die than stay here. We'd rather die than stay here. But instead of the whole family going, it was just my grandmother and her daughters. My dad decided to stay a little bit longer with us. And then finally, a decision was made that he, he would go first. And then he would send somebody to come get us. And that's what happened. He went first. And then here's the amazing part. Um, the uncle that managed to escape communism, who left before the communists took over, went to Thailand, lived there for a couple of years, and then immigrated to America. He came to San Jose. And then he heard on the news that the communists was chased out of the villages and the, uh, and the enemies has taken over the country. And there are all these Cambodians at the Kawadang refugee camps. So he um, asked a woman that he knew in Bangkok to go to um, the refugee camp, Kawadang, with a letter saying that, are you telling so, are you, um, I can't remember my grandmother's name, um, her official name, but are you the wife of my brother? And then there's a short message, and this lady was walking around, and my dad just one day managed to see the letter in the market. He's like, that's me. And that's how they managed to find the uncle who was living in San Jose. And he sent money, and they used the money to hire somebody. I think it was $500, and that was a lot of money back then a lot of money back then in Cambodia. Like right now, a teacher makes $120 a month. So he hires someone who, who knew us actually, I think it was mo my mom's second cousin or somebody, um, to s go back to the village and lead us into the refugee camp. And that's what he did. So my mom, she's pretty in incredible when I think about it. Okay, you have, you have a man, um, a guide, leading you to the refugee camp, and you're walking. You've got me, I was eight years old. My, young, my other brother was four. One was two, 
and another one was six months old. So, and when I asked her about it, she said, my mom being my mom, she said, it's not bravery. You just have to do what you have to do. I wasn't being brave. I did what I had to do. There was no choice. I, I don't know how they, my parents managed to survive. I was, I was young, so I don't remember fully. But whenever I would ask about things like that, being amazed, they always said, I don't know. You just do it. You just do it. You can serve food. Um, you watch out for each other. You just do it. You deal with it because you have no other option. When it's raining, you just put the tarp on and you stop moving for a while. You know? Of course, you're, you're scared, you're terrified, but you have no choice. You know, there's just something in our DNA that makes us want to survive. You, you just do it. Yeah. But my mom, she's always been a strong person emotionally and physically. She doesn't, she doesn't let things affect you. Even um, actually over the summer, when my dad was talking about it and he knows that it, it affects him, he has um, post-traumatic stress. To this day, he does not trust the government. He does not. And I was like, Dad, you've been in America more than you've been in Cambodia. And you know what this country is like. Oh, you never know. You never know. And then my mom, she's fine. So my dad actually said, your mom is just amazing. She's not affected by this at all. Like, you don't have nightmares about um, the Khmer Rouge era, about walking down the mountains and seeing dead bodies? She's like, no. I have memories of it, but it doesn't affect me. I've moved on. Whereas my dad still sees it. Yeah. And he still thinks about his life before communism, when his family was wealthy and having lost all of that and coming to this country and having nothing. So I know that that affects him. Even though he's become really successful in America, he still thinks about that. But most of all, he thinks about the betrayal. He understands why people did it. They were hungry. They were desperate. They were looking out for their own lives. But he cannot forget or really get over being betrayed by friends and families that he was nice to. He cannot overcome that. I, re I remember staying in people's homes. It was almost like um, the uh, um, Harold Tubman and the, un the Underground Railroad, where there's this system where when you get to a certain point, you get to stay in somebody's house. And of course, you pay them a little bit. You give them, um, whether it's a, a can of rice or a small a trinket in some way. And I do remember the border when we got there, seeing Thai soldiers. And I remember our guide bribing him. I remember exchanging something. I'm pretty sure it was gold. I remember that. And then I remember um, the soldier lifting my cap and saying, oh, I like your hat. And then he puts it back on. And then once we got into the refugee camp. And my mom took the cap and she said, oh, thank goodness, because she had sewn um, some jewelry into the cap. <laughs> yeah. And then when we got into the camp, um, we found my mom's sisters. Two of them um, left for the refugee camp. I, re I remember it was almost like a li little village. There was people set up a market selling meat and vegetables. And I remember um, the Thai people set up a market um, on the other side of the refugee camp. And I just remember looking at all the, the merchandise and the items and just being, wow, I can't believe these things exist. Yeah. We didn't stay in the refugee camp very long because by that point, um, my dad, his mom, and sisters had already received sponsorship from the uncle. So we did not stay there very long. I was eight and a half, and it was June. I think it was June 20th or 21st, um, 1981. And when I was, I, I do remember this part on the plane that I was so scared that I took off the seatbelt and got on the floor on all four. I remember that part. And that's all I remember about the plane ride. Then I remember landing in San Francisco and just seeing the lights. Just like, oh my gosh, what is this place? Lights everywhere, colors. And it was at night, so I couldn't really see the whole uh, city. And then we went to my uncle's house in San Jose. And that's when, because my grandmother and, my, and her daughters, my aunt, actually left the refugee camp first, like I think about six months earlier, and seeing them again for the first time. And being in that house and not seeing dust. I remember just amazed that there's no dust. 
Um, I remember having to use the toilet for the first time and being scared of it, of being sucked in. Um, like when I would flush the toilet and move far away. And I remember um, not knowing how to use the shower. It's like this thing that's falling down. So we would still use buckets and just pour water over our backs. And I, I just remember um, clean, just feeling clean. Or that you can just open a refrigerator, this cold thing, and get food. And I remember um, my dad's uncle, his family, taking us to the supermarket and just seeing items, food everywhere that you can just buy. And people do it easily without really thinking about the cost of something. I actually want to talk about the first time I saw television, you know, not knowing what it was, never seeing television ever until I was eight years old, eight and a half, and thinking, are there people in there? And the first thing I saw was the wedding of Princess Di. And, and, I, and I didn't know who they were. I thought, wow, this country is amazing. Their king and queen are so wealthy. Look at that. I, I, that's my first memory of television. But when I was in San Jose, I didn't go to school. We were only there for a few months. Um, we moved to Stockton. And the reason why we moved to Stockton is that when the U.S. bring you know, refugees to a country, they like to put people in, in certain places so that you can have resources. So we moved to Stockton, and I started second grade, going to school in second grade. And I had Mrs. Bowie, and she was Vietnamese. So I remember thinking, oh, wow, they have Asian people here who are not poor, who who um, are successful. And I remember being behind. There were other Cambodian kids, and we were pulled out for um, extra instruction. I remember that part. I remember just liking it. I remember, um, wow, they feed you at lunch. Because you know? we were on you know, free lunch. Um, most refugees who come into a country, Cambodian, Cambodian refugees were on welfare. So I remember, um, not until years later, being put down for that you know, by a teacher, because we were on free lunch. I remember him making a comment about that. And I don't remember specifically what he said, but I remember feeling crappy about it. When I was in third grade, there was an, um, a sixth grader. She She saw that my lips were chapped. And I didn't know about chapsticks. So she actually brought me chapsticks. And then um, she actually started to tutor me you know, during lunch to help me pronounce words. And that was her thing. And it's really sad. I don't even remember her name. Like to this day, I want to find her to thank her. So I remember that. I remember her being a sixth grader and just took me aside. And just one day, like, you know, when, when your lips are like that, you use this. So, <laughs> and I remember her um, during lunch, not the whole lunch, but she would say, what are you learning right now? And she would help me say words. I remember that. It's my, my parents, definitely. They would always say that we don't have to be this way. Even though this is not our country, but we need to take advantage of it. We need to take advantage of it. Because I remember feeling bad, because by the time I was in sixth grade, I definitely knew what welfare was like, you know, that people look down upon people who are on, on welfare. And my dad said, we don't have a choice. You know, I can barely speak English, but you go to school, and I'm going to school, we're not going to be on welfare forever. And sure enough, by the time I was in seventh grade, we were off welfare um, because my dad, he, he was an accountant for his dad's company before communism. But when you come to a country at the age of 32, 33, you're learning a new language. It's set. You can't pronounce words really well. and you. You speak broken English, and he knew that he's, he's not going to be in the business world. Uh, he's not going to be working for corporate America. So what do you do? Like most immigrants, you open up a small business. So my dad decided to open up a donut shop. You know, he learned the trade, learned how to make the, donut, the donuts, and started his own donut shop. So when I think about it, I'm always amazed. Like you, you barely knew English. How did you manage to go through all the processes? He's like, I just ask people. He's fearless in that way. He'll ask anybody, how do you do this? How do you do this? What paperwork do I need? Um, 
And I knew that I'm not going to be poor forever. I'm not going to be poor. And I like learning. I've always liked learning. And when I felt bad about being on public assistant, my dad actually said, I want you to remember something. And, and this stuck with me. The American government, they own us. They owe us. They owe us. I'm like, what do you mean? They bomb our country along the border. They owe us. You know? But then I was thinking, wait, didn't the communists cost this? It's like, well, they help contribute to it. They own us. So we're going to take advantage of what they offer until we can make it our, on our own. So. They need to take responsibility. I remember him saying that. I was like, wow, OK. Well, the one th thing that I definitely want to impress upon teachers is that even if they have zero language ability, they can understand facial expressions and body language. You do not have the right to show a kid that he or she doesn't belong or that you don't have the time to teach these kids. Like, I am an English teacher. I teach literature. I shouldn't have to have someone who could barely have um, the language. It's, it's just wrong. You should not make a kid feel that way. It's not his fault that he's where he is. It's not. He did not choose this situation. I think that's the one thing I want to impress upon teachers, that just to be patient. You, know, you were young once and not know anything. And they will get there eventually, you know. Maybe not in your class right away, but one day. I used to not talk about my, uh, my life before America because I was ashamed. And now I look back, why would, be a, why would I be ashamed of that? I didn't cause that. But it was shameful to know that that's something that happened in your country, um, that your own people t uh, committed genocide against your own people and how poor the country was and is. So that was something that was, I was not proud of, so I would not talk about it for a very long time. But um, when I started teaching Animal Farm and its connection to Cambodia, the first year I taught it, I didn't really talk about Cambodia. I did, but as a third person, like, oh, there's this country in Cambodia, and this is what happened. And then the second year, I didn't plan on talking about it, but as I'm giving a lecture comparing Cambodia, I'm doing the Khmer Rouge era to Animal Farm, to Communist Russia. And then at the end of the PowerPoint, I said, and I lived through that. And the kids were like, <gasps> and that's when they wanted to know more. And they asked me a lot of questions about it. And from then on, I decided that I'm going to talk about this every single time. So every time I teach that unit, I talk about my life and what it was like. You know, I never wanted to go to Cambodia. But in, in 2002, my mama wanted to go, and she didn't want to go by herself. So she said, I'll, I'll pay for the plane ticket. So we went. And when I got off the plane, I remember it was hot and dusty. And I saw the poverty. I saw the kids on the street. And I just started crying. And I was grateful to go back and see, um, you know, go watch the ruins and some family members. And I swore that I would never go back because I can't handle it. And then. Um, in 2004, a friend of mine said, I want to go. I want to see Uncle Wat. And begrudgingly, I went with him. And then after the second time, I realized, this is a part of me. I need to go back. I want to go back. And I've always had it in the back of my head that you're going to go back one day. You have the summers off. And you're going to teach. You're going to volunteer teach in some way. Because I am a strong believer in education. It's a way to get out of poverty. Education gives you opportunity. Um, you're not limited. Education allows a country to be free, to pay attention to their government, to not be abused and manipulated. And looking at you know, my, my motherland, Cambodia, where the government doesn't really care about educating the population. Sure, there's school, but it's not a priority. So you're going to go back. And Finally, two years ago, I decided I'm just going to go. So I did some research online to find schools that I can volunteer at. And I went for the first time in 2014, that summer. And I just, I loved it. It was fun. And I, and I like working with the kids that they're so enthusiastic about learning. So I went back again last summer.
and now this is a this is something that I'm going to do every year and I know for sure that when I retire at 55 even if the if the pay is low what I get in retirement is low I can live well in Cambodia I'm going to go back and live there and work within an organization to educate the population oh it's horrible because when, when the kids read Animal Farm they're thinking okay it's about talking animals this can't possibly happen and when I show them the parallel in what happened in Cambodia, they're like, oh my gosh, it actually did happen. Yeah, they were made this promise that we work together as a community, no money, we're all going to eat in a communal kitchen, everyone's going to have plenty, and then you find out that it's not true. How they, you know, on Animal Farm, they took education away. They took um, children, you know, piglets from, um, baby animals from the parents, just like the Khmer Rouge did with teenagers. You know, when you're 12 and 13, the Khmer Rouge take you away from your parents to, to brainwash you into their ideology. Now, my dad said that most of the soldiers were teenagers, and they were cruel because they were trained to be cruel. Now, they were the, the, the overseers were teenagers. So that's why I really believe in um, educating young people to think for themselves. The genocide is remembered by the older Cambodians and by the young people now. Uh, it's amazing that people managed to talk about that era with humor. You know, they would laugh about, oh, remember that time when we were trying to steal a fruit and almost got caught, and they would laugh about it. Um, they've managed to move on from what I see but then, when you really look, you see the breakdown of the family structure. Because the communists destroy family life, you really see the breakdown of the family structure. That people are not educated in terms of how to take care of your kids, um, how to discipline them, how to instill the value of education. You know that Cambodia has a middle class right now. Not, there's not a whole lot, but there's a middle class and there's an upper class. And those people know how to make sure that their kids are educated. They know the system. But then you have most of the population in the villages, and they're very poor. And these were the people that were most affected by the communists. And, and even though they can talk about it and laugh about it, I really see that it's damaged their psyche in some way, and it's being passed down to their children. The young people, from what I've heard, they know about it, they don't believe the full story. They're like, no one was smashing babies. You know? No one was electrocuting anybody. They kind of don't believe that part. That part They see that as exaggerated by their parents to scare them. You know, even though there are documents and actually videos documenting the cruelty. So, the young people see that as far removed. That's not our, that's, that's in the past. I can never say this lady's last name right. Malala Yesaf. Yes. Yes. Yesaf Sai. Yes, yeah. um, my student and I watched uh, an interview with her that she did with John Stewart, and she said that education is the key to peace. It's the key to ending conflict. So if you are an educator, you really need to be passionate about teaching kids, seriously, to think, to seek out information, um, to read about different people, not just your people, you know, to watch documentaries about other countries, not just keeping up with the Kardashians, um, to be aware of these things because if you're educated, it does end wars and conflicts because you know better. You, when you're educated, you know that, hey, women are just the same. They have the same ability. Hey, that religion there that you thought was so different from you, it came from the same book, the Old Testament. You believe the same thing. The pronunciation may be different, but you're not educated, so you're being manipulated by those who know to do your biddings. So that's the, that's the message I want to leave with teachers. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know about other discipline, but in English it's so easy to weave a um, story of genocide and oppression into it. For example, um, my honor students and I, we're working on an expository unit called education, and we're looking at different perspective about education. And 
I bring my story in. Like if you, if you look at oppressive societies, they all have, you know, besides being poor and lacking um, basic, you know, the luxuries that we have in the first world, is that the government will make sure that the population is not educated because that's how you keep them in control. So I always tell my students, like, I know school is dreadful. I'd rather be at home too, but here's why we need you to be educated. You know, I, I, I t there was a time when I used to think that, hey, if you're 16, you don't want to come to school, fine, but not anymore. I will force you to learn because I don't want a society of dumb people because that's when a political party can take over the country.